my favorite visual artist. Her name is Zoe Buckman. Her work is profoundly evocative and so painstakingly done. I am in absolute awe. And really, the truth is, I know Zoe as a friend and have for the past year. And so it's actually taken me <laughs> about a year to Google you. Aww, and to act thing. I know. <laughs> <laughs> and to know that you're such a beautiful person. And like, of course, you're beautiful as a, a woman, but a beautiful Psh. human being. You've been an advocate for intersectional feminist rights mm -hmm. for decades, a gorgeous writer, speaker. And actually, it took me until this time to really get under all of your incredible work for this long, particularly your visual art. I mean, I went to your last show, which was so beautiful. Um, can you tell me what what was the process you were there? It, was it embroidery? Yeah, so I was I was starting out um, by painting on these vintage textiles. I was collecting tablecloths. That show was mainly tablecloths because I was really trying to push the scale with which I work. So I would paint these figures and these sort of captured moments um, inspired by photographs. Mm. So painting with ink onto the fabric, and of course, it would bleed and you can't really control it perfectly yeah. which I think thematically is important because we're dealing about the female experience so why are you going to try and control everything and hem it I mean, in why are you trying to control why are you everything? trying to control the ink um so I would paint that's the big question then, exactly yeah and then do a shit ton of embroidery wait are we allowed to swear on this so much swearing. okay cool yeah great oh that would be really hard Oof. um but yeah then a, a whole load of embroidery and then often right at the end i would also add some applique which is sort of like collecting other bits of vintage textiles and cutting them out and sort of adding those as embellishments as well and then the whole thing gets ironed and framed so from afar it kind of looks like a painting yeah but when you come close you see like there's lots of threads and some of them are coming undone i've never actually seen anything like it in my life did you have you based your work on something that you've seen or did you make this up this whole process up um i i haven't seen no i've i feel like I've sort of carved out my own my own way and my own aesthetic. I, I don't think it's common to see portraits in embroidery. There is, um, and then also not that uh, relationship between painting and embroidery or also things coming undone. Mm. There's definitely a really long history of artwork that involves embroidery and textiles. Um, and for sure, I've been inspired by certain artists. I'm thinking of like uh, Louise Bourgeois. Um, and she did like a lot of really powerful arresting text. And so I actually started out yeah. just doing text with embroidery. And then it wasn't until the pandemic where I first started to depict women for the first time, actual forms. I was always too scared to. Um, Why? I felt like I, I've always been hyper aware of the fact that the visual fabric of the world that is just such a sort of proliferation of the female form and this sort of over ob objectification of women in art, in advertising, in entertainment. Like it's all you see on magazine covers and billboards and you go to museums, bunch of naked women, breastfeeding women kind of thing. Yeah. Um, not a lot of penises in museums. Not enough penises. So annoying. Like no tushes. Like give me more penises. Just give me a, give good, me a tush. Just give me a mm, Come on. good chest and dick and, and tush. But anyway... So not I enough. was like, there's just not enough. But you're not inspired by it. Because <laughs> like, you're not doing it. I'm not doing it. Yet. That. <laughs> yeah, you never know. You never know. We'll see. <laughs> life is um, long. Life is long, my friend. Let's do this. Um, but yeah, I, I, I didn't know how to make artwork that wouldn't be contributing to that. Mm. whilst using female form so objectifying I just stayed women. away from it exactly right. so I would use the things that we say um the garments that we wear the things that go on our kitchen tables the lingerie the gynecological instruments that are inserted inside us 
uh, you know, I, I did a piece with a uterus. So I'm looking at inside the body, but I never did the body mm. until the pandemic. And I was completely alone. Mm. <laughs> and I was obviously, you know, estranged from my community, my friends, my family, and I was missing people, humans, bodies. And so that was when I started really, really, really small embroidering little, that now they, now I feel like they look like stick people. <laughs> um, but then I was sort of, I've been expanding since then to yeah. larger, larger pieces and really getting detailed. Yeah, it's yeah. so beautiful. I also remember seeing a lot of um, your sculptures with boxing gloves. Yes. But the, what's really interesting is that it's it almost, to me, as someone who knows you, who is so fierce and so strong and so uh, much of a warrior and also wildly soft and vulnerable. Wow. It's so cool to see that visual depiction like in a glove. And I'm wondering... What was that like? Yeah, get delving into that that work, that strength, and that vulnerability that I really feel like you are completely. Thank you, Boo. Yeah. Thank you for picking up on it because that I feel is to me the most important thing throughout everything that I've made is mm. that sort of the area in between two polarized ideas, masculine and feminine, hard and soft. Um, and so I've always wanted to, to look at sort of intersections of those things. And mm. so my experience of being in these bodies is that there's a lot of violence and there can be subjugation and there could be oppression and there can be sexual violence and having our power taken away from us. Right. And so, yes, I wanna talk about the hard and the and the the trauma but I also really always want to look at like no like I wouldn't have it any other way because like I wouldn't choose to not be a woman because there is such pleasure and softness and light and creativity and spirituality and and community and these things that um, we tend to attribute to more feminine qualities. That's not to say, of course, men can't embody those qualities. We all know that we're a combination of both, yeah. but they are feminine um, attributes. And so beauty and softness and color and, and textiles have, has always been really important to me, even when we're looking at uh, boxing gloves or a punching bag on chains yeah yeah that's so beautiful so recently you came over to my apartment and you took a portrait of me yes and it this is sort of like like our like exchange in a way mm -hmm. you know just like I'm so curious about you this is my like portrait of you oh. <laughs> <laughs> yes you know and I feel like I can't paint a portrait of you without your mom mm. like especially if we're talking about feminism yeah actually your last name is her last name it's not even your dad's last name yes I mean who does that <laughs> yeah in the very 80s few. <laughs> yeah very few women my mom was like yeah no obviously the kids will have my name and my dad was like yes your mother is extraordinary really um, yeah yeah, my like dad that. was a feminist, is is a feminist too, um, you know, in his own flawed way. Um, <laughs> <laughs> dad. But yeah, exactly. But no, my mom was like, yeah, the, the, the children will have my name if, if, if we're going to do this. And so it was always really like sort of, I guess, challenging norms and gender norms and the division she of labor yeah that, that was always like a part of our home I mean it was it was practical and it was intuitive so for example my dad would cook every single meal no Br brilliant brilliant chef my dad brilliant hi dad hi, you're dad. doing great thanks we we appreciated the food for we do. sure at least the, at least that um <laughs> but my because my mom was like yeah I can't cook like if it was up to my Me mom, either Jenny, babe, I can't exactly. Cook. If it was up for my mom, we would have mozza with peanut Mayo? butter smeared oh. on top. <laughs> oh God! And then the next night it would be mozza <laughs> with a chunk of cheddar cheese. Like that would be it. 
my mum did not and care. dad Steve? but no my dad would it would be a whole thing he would he's one of those guys like there can be three things in the fridge and then it's like a beautiful mm. curry or a stew or something wow. so he would cook he loved to cook my mum would of course do other things and she would actually she loved to iron Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. she would do the laundry and the ironing my dad would do the cooking and my mum always had this joke that like he would come and serve the food that he spent hours <laughs> making while my mum's pouring wine for her and her friends and then he would serve them and she would be like oh darling what will you be eating <laughs> <laughs> I love that it sounds so, like they had this re really beautiful relationship yeah, actually yeah it was it was pretty adorable and it was just you and your twin brother is it me and um I have three brothers what yeah yeah one's a twin and then my older brother Michael who most people think is my twin he's the one that you met at my exhibition oh. we're super super close and he flew out for that <laughs> and then I have my eldest brother um we never got to live with him because he is my dad's son and not he's like a half what you'd call a half brother exactly wait, wait what do you mean what i'd call well a he's a, what one would call a half brother but i don't like to use that. i thought maybe like it like um, he's my half brother the, but, yeah, but like in 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 like british english no, they're called a half, <laughs> no that's what they're called they are called that okay but you, are, he's your brother but i feel bad about it because i'm like you know like half he was the treat brother because oh. yeah because we because we didn't get to see him all the time We'd be so excited for him to visit. So my parents would weaponize that and be like, if you kids <laughs> don't tidy up, we're going to say Joe's not coming around. Oh my God. I've been doing this new thing where I'm like weaponizing everything yeah, you should. just so that it they works. like don't pee their pants. Like stop peeing. I know you, I know you, this isn't a, an accident. This is a habit. Like if you do it once, twice a day and you're just walking around with that, right? You're agreeing with me. I'm <laughs> yeah. like, that's not an accident. 100%. It's like, do you want to eat? Like, do you, if you would like you food, want that ice cream, they, they like expect ice cream. <laughs> You think you're going to get ice cream when you're just like walking around with pee in your pants? The answer is no. I'm sorry. We I have agree. to lay down the law at some point. Babe, you're not going to see your brother. Bribery <laughs> is real. Exactly. That's what they did. They're like, listen, Zoe, I've had enough of your pants <laughs> peeing. You will not see your half brother. I said it. Half. Boom. <laughs> Weaponized. But just to say, getting back to my, when I came around to your house the other week. Oh, yeah. What I... Um, doing which I'm super excited to start um, I'm super excited to start the piece with you in it okay. but I'm really um, I'm excited about this new series that is obviously very dear to my heart as each one is but this is going to be um, portraits of my community and my family in domestic settings so that's why I wanted to come over to your house have a cup of tea Chill in your kitchen. In I'm your, your bedroom. family, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Just you're check. my fam. I just wanted to make that clear. You're, you're my fam, and you're going to be covered in thread on a on a tea uh, towel or a tablecloth somewhere. I can't <laughs> wait. <laughs> but some of them will be dangling some because will be dangling. you can't. We're a bit messy. I mean, how messy was my apartment when you came over? Oh, no, it was wonderful. It was perfect. I want to see life. I know it was so beautiful. Anyway, it was so beautiful to to be like captured in your eye. It was really very special. Um, anyway, Jenny Buckman yes. really s stood out to me. I know you write out Thank these beautiful you. things about um, the grief of her passing, and mm. she did such a good job with you. She did. Yeah, she, she did. did. Really, really yeah, did. I miss her so much. And I'm, I'm really, I see how her acting. Oh, she, did we mention even? No. That she was the head of acting at she Rada. Was. True this story. is that's for my that's for my um, actor community nerds. It's a big deal. It is a big deal. Can you tell Can you tell us the story about how she would yeah. bring over uh, her students and like yeah. they would they would cook a meal? Basically, she just never wanted to cook a meal. Yeah, she. <laughs> so <laughs> Jenny. <true. laughs> Jen. So true. So she was like, "How can I weaponize my Weapons. role?" Weapons. <laughs> <laughs> as your acting teacher to I gotta get eat. fed yeah. exactly um so my mom was the head of acting of the royal academy of dramatic art in london and she she started out as you know drama teacher in in secondary schools and then she started working at rada with students and then they you know over the years i think she was there for like 20 years and then towards the end then she was the, the head of acting because she was the tits um but basically she was super fun and irreverent and her whole um I guess I don't know ethos if you call it that was like I'll never shame my students 
she's like, cause I couldn't do it. I couldn't get up on stage and actually never acted. So she was like, I will never use those kind of tactics that I think a lot of drama teachers and directors use Most. particularly, yeah particularly in like the 90s and early 2000s and whatnot. It's revolutionary that she did that. Actually, yeah. Because, I mean, she, uh, I, I went to acting school in the 2010s mm-hmm. and they were still just like the way, the way that people taught you how to act was by belittling you, oh, yelling at you. Horrible. I know. Telling you you're fat or that horrible. you need to dye your hair. Or like, Awful. you know, that's, that's how... It, it was like a boot, it really it really was like a boot camp. Yeah. So the idea that your mom knew not to treat people that yeah. way, I can only imagine what kind of mom she was. Yeah. So they if that's loved, how she treated loved, loved her, her students, exactly. and that was the norm. Yeah. And people write to me all the time saying like, I really felt like your mom was my mom, and she was a mother to us all. And she would refer to her ex students as my boys and my girls. So like, if she saw. Um, you go to the theater with her, you watch TV with her, whatever. And she'd be like, oh, that's my boy, that's my boy. That's my boy, that's one of my boys. <laughs> that's my boy. That's my boy. Um, but anyway, so basically the first year, when she had first year students, which she was always given at the end of the year for the last semester, she would pick a play that they would be studying for the entire semester. And then she would host a dinner party at our house at our Mm -hmm. crumbling down, broken down house in East London in Hackney. And they would have to show up in character, fully dressed, all of it. And they'd be asked to bring an object with them. But they also, as a class, without her involvement, had to choose a meal to cook together. That would have been the meal that they would have eaten in that period or that country. So it would be an Irish stew or like, Rush. It was often Russian food <laughs> because of Chekhov. But exactly, yeah. exactly. Um, so then they would show so up. So do you like know a lot about Russian food? Yeah, I mean, like I, I guess <laughs> Chekhov. I I know because I've I've been to so many plays and I know with the <laughs> Russian plays is that everyone leaves at the end. Oh yeah. Yeah, there's always everyone's packing up their bags and yeah. leaving. Hmm. Um, but yeah, so they would show up in character and it, they would all drink. My mum would roll joints. It would get really really <laughs> wild and fun. I love her. And and me and my brothers would just be like, Hee-hee-hee. but you, were you sort of invited? Yeah, we were totally invited. And in fact, one year, I think the play, forgive me for not knowing, it was an Irish play. I think it was called The Wake, mm-hmm. or in it there was a it centered around this wake. Mm-hmm. So they decided to do that. Oh. And so my mom dressed up my big brother, put white powder on his <gasps> face, dressed him up in one of my dad's suits, and had him li- lying oh on the kitchen table. I love it. While they were all around and going, oh. Oh, oh Jesus Christ I'm so sorry and oh my God. do you know what I mean it was yeah, yeah it was hilarious and my brother's there just like I'm dead <laughs> yeah I times. love that so much it was wild um you've really taken on the torch being an intersectional feminist yeah I try the, uh, the only other girl in the yeah in the family yeah and she she whipped those boys into shape. Yeah, she did. She did. She did, did a good job with them. Yeah. But being surrounded by so many men, you know, I've got my three brothers and my dad and our neighborhood, it's sort of the predominant culture was one of toxic masculinity and violence and like being hard and street. You needed to know the right people. You needed to know that, you know, you had to have that person that protected you, who you could run to and call if, you know, we got broken into a lot. My brothers got mugged. Everyone at some point got beaten up. What? Yeah. Where is this? Yeah. Um, a, a lovely little neighborhood called Stoke Newington, which sounds nice, but it's Stokey. Oh, Stokey. In Hackney. And then when I went to secondary school outside of the borough, my girlfriends weren't allowed to come over. Like their mm. dads would be like, nah, you're not going Stokey, you know. Oh, wow. Yeah, they'd be like, tell Zoe she can come here, but you're not going to Zoe's house because it was it was a really rough neighborhood. Of course, now is it not? it's like buggies and prams and lovely coffee shops and shit like that. But it was really, really rough. I think we were broken into and robbed like five times. Wow. Every night there would be crackheads would come and knock on the door and ask for money. 
but and they were very honest, which I really appreciated. Like they'll be like, "Sorry, darling, I know I'm fucked up, but is your dad's home? Can you give me some money because I need to buy Pampers?" Like there was no like. And was, did you give him the money? I'd be like, "Dad, this is crackhead here for you." And then later would be the Jehovah's Witnesses. What? Yeah, and then there would then there would be people from the Labour Party coming and knocking. Like it was wild. That is wild. I know. Do your parents still? I don't know. How dad... did we get into this? How I just was, want to know everything about, about you. Wait, where we're was make, I? We're, we're, we're creating um, a, a, like a, a portrait. Right, right. We're, we're doing creating... a biography here, right. are we not? <laughs> but basically, we're taking masculinity behind the scenes. Everywhere. Oh, masculinity well, I, everywhere. Masculinity. Which meant that mine and my mother's relationship really, it was even tighter and closer than it would have been. And it was really galvanized in spaces like the bathroom because madhouse full of boys yeah and so when we only have one bathroom and so we i have so many memories of like i'm in the bath and my mum's on the toilet mm -hmm. i'm you know brushing my teeth and my mum's in the bath and yeah. so that was really where we would connect and so i started to think a lot about spaces and rooms in the house and i feel like as is the case in most families our whole world revolved around the kitchen table yeah um which is why i i use a lot of those sorts of things in in my work and meals were very important to your mom meals were very, yeah exactly <laughs> established exactly. not the cooking of the meals no not that no. bit um but yeah and so i feel like that neighborhood also played a role in why i'm drawn to things like the boxing gym and boxing oh, wow. iconography in my work is because in a way, like moving to New York and living in a much safer neighborhood. Poo, poo, poo. Like, <laughs> poo, poo, poo. And when I first moved here, I moved into my then boyfriend, now ex-husband, gorgeous bachelor pad mm. in Tribeca, bitch. Very nice. Oh my Very God, good. I was gagged. I was like, what is this? Um, but it was obviously like a much more pedestrian life. Yeah. And I feel like there's always been a part of me that misses street. Some of that street, that roughness. And so then when I started boxing and I stepped in down into this boxing gym in the guts of um, Church Street, this Puerto Rican boxing gym, I was like, mm, mm, my people. Yeah. Smells terrible in here. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes you just need to get a little raw. Actually, mm -hmm. it's something that I really appreciate in your work and also even in your advocacy, uh, the way you write and the way you speak, like you aren't afraid. And I I, I got to tip my hat to Jenny once more. Yes. Because always as cool. a, I, I, I mean, you quote cool that? Because I think moms do it. Like moms have a huge role in, yeah. in this. And just knowing that she was an acting teacher, just like, you're not afraid of the dark. Yeah. You're yes. not afraid to speak about the the underworld. Yeah. Or even to get in there and and maintain your beauty. Yeah, absolutely. And she was a writer. So the written what she was a writer also as well as being oh. an acting teacher. So the written word was so like huge in our family, whether it was a Shakespeare play that she was working on with her students or whether it was a radio play that she was working on for the BBC or, or you know, whatever she was doing, it was like, it was to do with art and it was to do with literature. Wow. Yeah. And I mean, when I walked into your kitchen, actually the piece that you kept for yourself oh, is yeah. a piece of lingerie with a Tupac Shakur yeah. quote. I yeah. mean, that's literature and it's also street. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly, exactly. The hard and the soft. I love that so yeah. much, the hard and the soft. So what's the hard and the soft going on for you these days as an intersectional feminist, mm -hmm. as an artist? What has been? What have you been grappling with these days? Yeah, that's a beautiful question. Thank you. Thank I you. I think that it is such a hard time right now, arguably, and, you know, it's a really, really hard time to, to be Jewish, yeah. And there's so many misconceptions about who we are, what we believe in, where we come from, sure. why we're here, how we operate, what our values are. And so it's, um, you know, and that's, that's, you know, separate to, of course, these huge, this huge atrocity that many people in our community experienced and 
the rising hate crimes that many of our, the people in our community are experiencing. So to answer your question, like the hard and the soft right now, it's been, there's been, it's been a period where I've experienced a lot of cruelty that I was not expecting, like cruelty from women, from my sisters, like both online in, in the form of um, death threats and rape threats from strangers. Like, you know, that that's she. It's but terrible. It's so scary. It is. I was actually wondering, you know, I ask you all the time, how do you handle it? Um, and I didn't know the piece about you living in a like dodgy na- neighborhood right. as a child. Right. And you sort of. Right. Yeah. I mean, I. And being broken into. I didn't know that. Yeah. I'm I... sorry that, that you're experiencing it right now. You don't Thank deserve that. Thank you. Thank you. I never made that connection, actually. That's what I'm here for. Thank you. Yeah. Do- wow. Yeah. yeah. Big Breakthrough. Box. That's what they're here for. Um, so I, I talked my way out of... I was um, I was mugged by these two rude boys in, with their, their hoodies up. It was late at night and it was on my street. And I was 20. I was returning home from university. Oh, I went to university, a horrible part of England called Manchester. No offense, but like- But like terrible. That's the armpit of England. Really? Bro. Oh, it's not fun there. <laughs> it rained every day. But anyway, so I returned home to Hackney and these two boys were following me home and I was on my mobile, you know, the little do 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 The flip phone. Mm-hmm. And, um, and they were like, give me your phone. And I turned around and they had this glistening under the street, like this like huge um, screwdriver. <laughs> <laughs> oh god i was like well you couldn't get a knife um, <laughs> back where i'm from they use a knife I? I was like well i'm not scary enough where's your knife bro no but basically i i talked my way where's your out- knife bro <laughs> kill me i talked my way out of it and um and because i yelled at them and like i pretended to be harder than i am like i went away and this other person yeah. took over and she was really fucking scary god bless her um Love i mean unfortunately so we share a body so it's lucky mm. that they believed that she was more connected than she was mm-hmm. because i would i can't i would not i can't fight i can't fight a screwdriver that's for sure anyway so violence and then and mm. then online violence it is what it is but i think that i've felt a lot more fear and anxiety and pain and hurt and and a sense of like cruelty from women that i know i'm so sorry zoe and that's you do not so deserve that fucked. thank you thank you and then but the soft is that at the same time it's been such a galvanizing moment between a within my community but b within like true allies Yes. Do you know what I mean? You're like, wow, like you love them even more now. If they can show up for you and be like, yo, like this, I see you and I'm here and I love you and I see that you're in pain. I see that you're a human being. Yeah, even if we feel differently politically or we feel differently about things or we use different language or whatever it is, like I am your friend and I've got your back. And then when I've experienced a lot of the opposite, which is just being completely like, ostracized and like sliced out of people's lives who I've known for 20 years who I considered my sisters who I would never have imagined never ever ever would have imagined that they that that friendship would come to a very abrupt end at a time where I have felt actually the most unsafe as a Jewish person or yeah. as a person yeah as a Jewish person a yeah Jewish person. in my home like I've you know I've never been so so scared on the subway or, you know, of, I don't know, I guess being, like, being clocked as being Jewish and then being the victim of a hate crime. Yeah. Also because you wear a Magen David, but... I but, do. But besides that, you know, when you get hate messages... Right, exactly. You know, they're they're embedding that fear right. in you. You know, terrorists want to terrorize us. Right, exactly. Not just physically. Like, I mean physically. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. <laughs> they also want to terrorize us physically. But they want to terrorize our soul. Right. They really do. Right. And, you know, something that I really appreciate you for is that you put words to that experience 
you also put, you know, and you always have, you've taken traumas and you've been able to express them mm. with with that softness and that fierceness always present. Like, I'm not going to let you ruin my life. Right. I won't let you do it. Right. And I'm in an enormous amount of pain and I represent a lot of people yeah. right now. Yeah. Particularly Jewish women, yeah. actually. Yeah. And I, I think what's um, particularly difficult about this time is that if you are a survivor of sexual assault, and you're also Jewish and you're having to, because of so much, you know, rape denialism and the dehumanization of the women and girls in Israel and what happened to them on that day. Like you and I was, were saying recently, like we wouldn't still need to be talking about these atrocities, about the, the rape and sexual violence that occurred on that day. We wouldn't still be talking about it. If I'd it rather wasn't, not. I would so rather not, thank I'd you. I'd rather not. If it wasn't for the fact that we are consistently told, prove it, didn't happen, that's propaganda, no. And it's like, that has that has led to us having to relive and go over and keep speaking out, screaming out, you know, why won't, why won't certain organizations condemn this? Why are you pretending this didn't happen? Well, or that it's continuing to happen. That's the other right, thing. Right, exactly. There's, still, There's that as well. At the time of this recording, there are still 19 exactly. women being held hostage who we know by eyewitness report are, are, yeah. are experiencing sexual violence. But you know, still people will go propaganda. If you mention it, they'll say that's propaganda. Which is, how, can, yeah. how can a fact be propaganda? I'm exactly. Sorry. Also, because I think both of you and you and I both agree like, we're not for war. No, I, 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 absolutely I, I, not. If we could just like weave the story together piece by piece, fact yeah. by fact, we could all maybe pool all of our, you know, goodwill together and get us the fuck out of this terrible situation. Yeah, but absolutely. I, I hate being stuck on, um, I, I hate being stuck on the denialism. It is really yeah disgusting yeah because we're supposed to be believing all women yeah exactly and we all need to like we need to at least agree on some fundamental things here children should not be dying not in gaza not in israel not should, anywhere w women men children they should not be being raped not in prisons in israel not palestinian women in prison in israel not Israelis taken hostage into Gaza. Like, if we can't agree on these fundamental truths, like something is very, very wrong. I know. That's that's why I think the this this fear has really taken hold. Because I think, you know, there's there's one uh it's one thing to grapple with extremism and to accept that there are extremists in the world, but when your own friends mm, yeah. are you know accepting that way of thinking accepting that retribution yeah that's scary yeah like well you know those women kind of had it come into them zoe How and i'm like you? those women could have been my women like that those women could have been me and my child my mother my grandmother so therefore by that rationale if that had happened to me you would still be going out holding a placard saying by any means necessary. You would still be arguing online and pontificating over the fact that it that I had it coming to me. And it's like, you know, it's, it's amazing to me. Like I had this beautiful artist um, reach out to me. She's She said to me, you know, I'm a Lebanese proud Muslim and and I see you and I see your pain. I see you as a proud Jewish woman and I want you to know that you will always be a sister to me. Yeah. And I like said basically the exact same back and like I see your pain and I see what like what is happening to Muslim people in Gaza in this drawn out trauma and I am not okay with that. Yeah. And so we actually met up you uh, did? We met up this morning. No. Yeah, we met up this morning, and we're How'd gonna. That go? Yeah, it was amazing. We're gonna we're gonna work on something together. And when she sent me that message, what I couldn't help but think is like, wow, this this is a Muslim Middle Eastern woman. Yeah. Who is seeing the human in me? Yeah. And my own. Yeah. Best friend who is a white woman. <laughs> yeah. Who I've known for twenty years. Yeah. 
who made me the godmother of her daughter. She has cut me out of her life. She knows everything about me and she can't tolerate knowing me. And this stranger who is actually way more personally connected to what is happening than white women in West London. Yeah. She's reaching out to me and like, yeah, that, you know what? That energy is what we need more of. Let me put my love and my time into women and voices like that. Yeah, I, I do think that the Muslim Jewish solidarity, yeah, um, Arab Jewish solidarity that is so profound yeah. and so available actually. Yeah. Um, and that there is something going on with white saviorism yeah. and white guilt that is uh, is sad. Yeah. It's it's sad for people uh, who, of white descent, yeah, who are sort of being like washed about, you know, yeah, um, and really feel and really feel like they need to pick a side because their opinion is the most authoritative opinion. Yeah, um, like how demoralizing yeah completely I mean yeah and I think it's you know it's especially I, they talk about in conflict and conflict resolution how often it's the the people in the diaspora that find it so hard to move away from their position because they feel I think a few things like one is they don't have to live the results of what they're screaming about do you know what I mean they're in the diaspora they're safe. They're far away from whatever this conflict is, wherever this conflict is in the world. If you're in the diaspora, you're not actually dealing with the consequences of what does or does not happen. Yeah. So you can be more opinionated because cool, that's nice for you, you're safe. Yeah, I mean, we're really seeing that, right. aren't we? I mean, exactly. people who, who are able to take the day off to, you know, protest a cancer, you know, did you know right. this? Yeah. That they they actually protested Sloan Kettering. Yeah. Oh God, that's so sad. Yeah. How privileged, you yeah. know. You know. Meanwhile, there are real people dying and being tortured and on their person. Right. Um. I find it. Right, and the you know there's probably an opportunity for more togetherness over there than there is. Yeah. Here in America, I mean, and certainly online because. There's no unity in the online space. We know that. It's not designed that way. Right. The, because those polarizing views are the ones that get likes. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Instagram. I mean, I'm grateful for your voice on Instagram, actually. <laughs> Ditto. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I just feel like people have really... I, I've seen your post shared so many times because the way you do use language so clearly and like empathetically... Like yeah. you really genuinely care for both and all sides. We are all really suffering in this situation and particularly the, the women. Yeah, yeah. You know, I was saying to this eyes who I met this morning, you know, I, I have from day one, if you look at what I posted on October 7th, I have hold, oh. I've held two truths. However, I am not gonna sit here and pretend that I am a 50-50 kind of a person. Like I know that if I say, you know, a hundred words, there might only be 10 that are talking to the other side of this suffering. And there might be 90 that are talking about my family, my friend, you know, a friend of mine had six members taken hostage. A curator mm -hmm. friend of mine had her grandmother shot and burned. Two friends, of, three friends of mine from LA, London and New York all know two people, one who was killed and one who is, is still being held. So it's like, you know, I, I said to her this morning, like, yes, I've always held two truths. Yes, I've always tried to be as, as nuanced as I possibly can. But I know that I speak more to my identity and, and my community and my history. And that's okay. And she said the exact same thing is true for her. Yeah. And like, that's cool. I, I think it's also necessary and honest. Yeah, that's know? all right. I think like, I also make a note uh, you know, there's like a highlight on my um, Instagram that says like context in, in, in quotes, which is like the context is that I have family in Israel. Right. The context is that I'm a Jewish woman with Jewish children. Mm -hmm. The 
that's the context and it doesn't take away my empathy but i want you to know yeah where it where is I'm real from because for me it is real yeah, like exactly. i have skin in the game literal yeah. skin you yeah. know and so i i i i care on all sides i i, I also know a lot mm-hmm. about the um about the region and the conflict which yeah. at the end of the day i'm going to be advocating for my literal existence mm-hmm. and for my family mm-hmm. i don't want anyone else to suffer i right. really don't besides the fact that someone else's suffering does nothing for for my family right right uh, i but i but i really do appreciate you saying like this is who i am right and if i if if 0.01 percent of the population which is like what jews are don't speak up for ourselves yeah exactly what well, no one else is gonna insist no one else <laughs> Right, we discussed, right? No. No one else is no going to. No one can to. say bubkiss, babes. No, 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 no. I mean, they're saying lots, actually. Yeah, they're saying many. Right outside Sloan Kettering. Many things, many things, but um, no. Yeah. You do it in a really artful way. Thank you, mate. And I'm really, really, really grateful. Someone was asking, um, uh, you know, leading up to this interview, just, you know, how how you've been handling, like, that the progressive mm. friends like even just like the idea of this progressive movement turning yeah. on jewish people yeah it's been so oof, it's been so upsetting surprising shocking demoralizing all of these things like i always knew there was a huge problem um with anti-semitism in the left i've been speaking about that for a couple of years you did know yeah 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 yeah. absolutely i'm I'm still so disappointed yeah no but i didn't know the extent of it Mm. i didn't know that i would have my own friends literally justify rape massacres torture i never knew that they would be coming out with theories as to why it is actually necessary um these are people that i've done shows with do you know what I mean? Like I do. Th- th- these are curators that I've worked with, and so it's been, it's been really, um, really, really upsetting. And I think that how I've handled it is probably not very well. Oh really? <laughs> yeah, probably quite poorly. Oh yeah, you for sure. Like you're handling it so nicely. For, for sure, I could have handled it better. But um, I think that ultimately, I I'm. I need to remind myself and I do remind myself of what my core values are. Yeah. Because even if I don't feel that the liberal progressive space um, cares about my life and they may not be, I, I may not call myself a liberal progressive anymore. Like I maybe don't like those words because of what they represent. I know that my values are progressive values. Yeah, so my values are liberal values. I will vote in that way. Yeah. Um, and I will act and protest and give and donate and speak and highlight and amplify for my values because those those don't change. No, you can't take that away from me. No, you can't take that away from me. I'm gonna keep so I'm going to keep my freaking nose clean. I'm going to keep to my side of the street and do the work. But um, I no longer feel that that club wants me. And so they, I'm, I'm, yeah. I give back my membership. Mm. Like I was in a cab with a, a, a cab driver from Cuba. Mm-hmm. And, you know, so I try very hard to like put down the phone and right. really talk to a cab driver, by the yeah. way. They're great. Yeah. Uh, yellow taxis. Okay. <laughs> They're fucking awesome. Um, I remember my dad used to just like always just like jabber away. And so yeah, I, I really story. enjoy I really enjoy their stories. And something that he was just reminding me was that like the extreme left mm. is as violent and mm-hmm. as cruel 100%. as the extreme right. Yeah. And I, I'm not sure that people know that mm-hmm. like outright that that communism in China, mm-hmm. in Russia, in mm-hmm. Cuba, I mean – the their their people are absolutely I mean executed mm-hmm. and they're held hostage yeah. there's they they own all of their businesses and they own their lives yeah if we as a progressive liberal society really veer too far mm-hmm. to the extreme of of that camp we're in 
Oh, it's so, it's so naive. And it's also like it's the like, minute, if that started to be put into practice here in the States, do you think these students would be, would, would enjoy that and want that? Absolutely not. But these They'd students like, are- Take me back to capitalism. I'm in take me Ivy back to school. Exactly. I mean, really, you can't even get educated in these, in these places. I mean, they're right. really, uh, where are the adults telling these children? Right. These students are children. Like, yeah. where are these adults telling these children you are- advocating for war yeah yeah for by any means necessary is a slogan of massacre yeah you are advocating for bloodshed yeah i mean look the amount of swastikas that are being graffitied in say ivy league schools or even in our in in brooklyn the amount of uh racial slurs against jews are we really trying to say those those are all far right no. white supremacist neo Nazis? They don't go to Harvard, babe. <laughs> These are left wing liberal kids. But if who are their parents? Right, Zoe? exactly. Who are their parents? Exactly. But if you're if you're gonna graffiti a swastika onto a Jewish student's locker at Yale, you really look like. You really look like a neo-Nazi right now, bro. Mm -hmm. You look like a KKK youth. Yeah. Well, like the, that's the same playbook. I think there's a there's an understanding that like you know, religious extremism looks gory. It right. looks awful. Right. It looks restrictive. You know, I think like oh, those conservative people with their god. Ew. Right. Right, right, right. <laughs> yeah. So we understand what that looks like. Mm -hmm. Right? But we don't, I think there's this bizarro land miseducation around how cruel the left can be. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. all under the guise of kindness and acceptance. I mean, it's wild. Could it's you? Wild. They're, they're mean, babe. Babe, they are spitting on Jewish people to death. No, like with, um, like, spit yeah <laughs> but they're nasty spit who does this is not kind this is not you guys are here talking about safe spaces and and what language is the kind language but you will spit on a jewish person what it, please show me how it makes sense i don't know make it make sense <laughs> my friend got a um got the greatest dm the other day um that read something like you know, I, I'd be more than happy to send you anti-racist and anti-colonialist material so that you don't support genocide. And this Jewish woman whose grandparents had 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 literally lived through genocide mm -hmm. and colonialism yeah. and racism. Go away. <laughs> Go get the fuck out of here. Yeah. Thank you, white American person. Go. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. I'm good. Yeah. I mean, we got to laugh. Yeah. We got to laugh. Mm -hmm. Um, Tell me, what are you up to next? You did mention that my photo. Your beautiful visage. Will um, be embroidered. <laughs> what am I up to next? So I'm working on, I'm starting this new series. Um... I have some work at the moment uh, in a group show at a gallery in Texas, in Dallas, called VSF, uh, Very Small Flat, very, Various Small Fires. Love that gallery. Um, in the summer, mm -hmm. I have some work uh, boxing, the punching bags, the boxing glove sculptures. I have some of those going to a show at um, SF MoMA. Beautiful. In the summer. And then my next solo show is likely going to be in London next year. Oh my God, congratulations. Yay, thank you, boo. I'm so proud thank of you. you. I'm in awe of your skill. Thank I really you, am. Babe. Like, such evocative, such painstaking work. Thank you. I'm a little, I'm a little nervous about doing anything in London right now. Oh, do you want to tell us about that? Well, I just feel like the... The, the most amount of hostility I've experienced has been from Londoners. Really? Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah, those are those are the, the harshest kind of um, slicing out. It's, it's very culty there. And so, you know, I'm just a little, I'm a little worried that like 
they don't like me anymore. <laughs> I mean, they like you. And Londoners they... don't want me home. Oh, well, that's probably uh, why it hurts so much. Right, because exactly. that's your home. Exactly. I think something that, like, you know, sometimes we forget as, you know, diaspora Jews is how much we love our countries. Right, right, right. It's why right. it hurts so much about, you know, in, in the United States for me. I'm yeah. an American. Right, 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 right. I'm Jewish, exactly. but am I? but i'm american yeah, yeah. like it hurts me like to feel like your your home doesn't yeah. want you back yeah that's painful it's really shitty and maybe it's in my head and maybe like my show will be a, a raging success mm. likely 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 yeah or maybe i'll, I'll get egged. and it could be very maybe i'll get be very <laughs> I mean, if you're like, um, <laughs> it, it could be very healing yeah true it true. really could be very healing yeah and it'll be a gift for them because your work is truly a gift. Thank you. Yeah, mate. thank you for everything you do and everything you are. Jenny Buckman, great job. Ah, thank you. Yeah. Thank you for having me. I'm and for the being... way you, oh, by the way, for the way you mom. We didn't ah. even touch on that, but I get the I get the pleasure of knowing you and your kid and it's just a joy, really a joy. Oh, well, my kiddo loves you. Yeah. And I love you. Yeah, I love you too. At Zoe Buckman on Instagram. See. What else? Um, I have a website, which is just zoebuckman.com. It's Boring. cute. Boring. Yeah, but it's cute. I, I went, I, I, after my Google search, I went down the rabbit hole. It's, Bless you. It's great. It's a great website. <laughs> Thank you. Some of your writing is there. That's true. Interviews. Yeah. Thank you, Mama Jo. I forgot about that. Yeah, I'm here for you. <laughs> Doing my job. Um, all right. Well, thank you for this again. Thank and you. for everything you do. And we'll see you guys in two weeks on Mom Curious. I'm out. Thank you, as always, for listening to the Mom Curious podcast. My name is Daniela Ravani. I am your host. And I would love to continue this conversation at Daniela Rabani on Instagram. And if you'd be so kind to rate and review, share this podcast, I would be just really grateful. Catch you next time every Tuesday on the Mom Curious Podcast, produced by Hoff Studios. You can find them at Hoff Studios on Instagram as well. All right, have a great day.